19th of May, 2021, by Giri Monastery. Thinking about impermanence, anicca. One positive aspect of anicca is that we're not doomed to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again ad infinitum. We can actually train ourselves to become better and transform ourselves and we're not always going to be bound by the defilements or the mental obscurations that cause suffering. So that's one positive aspect of anicca. Anger is impermanent, greed is impermanent, delusion is impermanent. So that's good to think about putting a positive spin on things can be helpful sometimes. Or remembering the kindness, past kindnesses that we've received. For me, this is like on Tudong, the past kindnesses of people who have offered food while we're outside of the monastery walking on Tudong and in America, this is a profound practice, a pref- profound experience, being in my home country and relating it to it in a way that's different. Or even just going and spending the night at the house of someone who's offered their place where we can stay when a monk needs to go to the airport and then having them offer breakfast in the morning, and that's also Tudong. That's also the same type of kindness, people who support us long-term and want to create a long-term relationship with the Sangha. So that's kindness. And they'll get the results of that. So in that sense, the Sangha becomes a field of merit for the world, because it gives the opportunity for people to both practice and express that kindness, that wish to support. Yeah. Thinking today at tea time, having been on four Tudongs in America, and none of them were that incredibly long. The first one was the longest, just over a month. So none of them were that incredibly long or amazing or heroic or anything. But it's notable that out of those four, there's only one day that I didn't receive food out of all four of those. And that's walking through remote areas, sometimes not even coming to a town or a village, but having somebody stop on the highway and offer food. So that's a reflection of both kindness and faith. And also it's a reflection on the courage to even have faith. Uh, That's the other aspect of anicca, which is not sure. We can translate it as impermanence or inconstancy, but we can also translate it as not sure. We might have a strong feeling that we're not going to be supported, that somebody's not going to give us food while we're walking on the highway. That's not sure. So that opens the mind to any possibility. When we really know not sure, it really opens the mind, and then that helps with the mindfulness, and that in turn helps with the present moment awareness that we're trying to cultivate all the time. And that present moment awareness then helps with the sense of ease that we're trying to cultivate. So when we come to practice and we come to the formal practice of sitting and walking meditation, what we're trying to cultivate is a sense of ease and well-being. And then we find that there's various hindrances to that sense of ease and well-being. And then that's what we have to work with in the practice. 
most of the practice, if not all of the practice, is just working with the hindrances and also noticing when the hindrances are absent. So there's five hindrances. Traditionally, there's five hindrances, the sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness, and doubt. And that's what we have to work with. And the Buddha gives the analogy of the mind being like water in various states. And when there's sensual desire, it's like water with, the mind is like water with dye in it. When there's ill will present, the mind is like boiling water. When there's sloth and torpor present, then the mind is like water with pond scum on it. And when there's restlessness, the mind is like water with waves on it. And when the mind has doubt, then the mind is like muddy water in the dark. So giving that analogy of the mind being like various states of water. And then, of course, when the hindrances are absent, then it's like clear water, clear, still, and cool water that we can peer down into and see the fish swimming about. We can see pebbles on the bottom. We can see and discern various things that were hidden to us before when the water wasn't clear. And then that's the analogy for the Four Noble Truths, which we can discern when the mind is still and free of hindrances. And those Four Noble Truths weren't clear previously. The truth of dukkha, suffering, the truth of the samudaya, the cause of suffering, the truth of niroda, the cessation of suffering, and the truth of maga, the path leading to the cessation of suffering, and the cause of suffering being the kama tanha, bhava tanha, vibhava tanha, so the three types of tanha, or craving, so we can see that more clearly, we see those the roots of suffering more clearly. We can also see and discern the, realize the possibility of the ending of suffering, the neuroda, or the non-arising of suffering is another way of looking at it. And the non-arising of suffering, that's the ease and contentment and well-being balance. And then the path, which is the integrated approach to the ending of suffering. And that doesn't just include the sitting and walking meditation, but it includes every aspect of our lives. And so we try to bring every aspect of our lives onto the path. So when things get difficult in the course of our practice or we feel disheartened, the the word in Thai for feeling disheartened is it's almost like onomatopoeic, ta toy. So when we feel ta toy, when we feel disheartened, then we can think of kindnesses that have been done to us. So when we practice for a long time and we keep precepts for a long time, it's very easy to recollect different kindnesses that have been done to us. Even just the kindness of, I'm a monk because Monk Parpasano ordained me. So that's, that's an immense kindness that I wouldn't be able to be here right now. I wouldn't be able to be practicing as a bhikkhu if it wasn't for that. And then the offering of alms food, that's a daily kindness. Sometimes we forget about this and then it's easy to get up in our heads and give rise to that negativity. And we can get locked in or sucked into that. So then it's important to come back to consciously bring these things up. We don't naturally have gratitude. A a normal person doesn't naturally have a sense of gratitude, but it actually has to be cultivated and recollected and made habitual. And then this happens when 
we are surrounded by Kalyanamitta, which is our Dhamma friends who steer us in that direction and encourage us to have gratitude and encourage us to practice and meditate. And I can think of a lot of different Dhamma friends, different monks, but also lay people who have caused me to want to practice and meditate more and be more ardent in my practice. And so a lot of gratitude for them. And also gratitude starts to come about when we practice and then it starts to work. So when the practice actually works, we naturally have a sense of gratitude. We do have to cultivate gratitude, but then when the practice actually works, then we'll feel a natural sense of appreciation and thankfulness for what we've been given. One way also to cultivate gratitude is to realize that a lot of what we have right now hasn't necessarily come from our own efforts, but it's been people who have been lifting us up. The the word for ordination, upasampada, means to be lifted up. So there's this acknowledgement that we're we're tumbling down in samsara and we need to be lifted up. So we get, we get lifted up into the training. It's good, good to recollect that. So we might feel like a lot of what we have is from our own efforts, but most if not all of the good things that we have is actually from the efforts of others, whether it was somebody giving us our first Dhamma book or somebody recommending to try this monastery out or all of the energies that came together to create the food for the meal today. So that that meal, even if you just think about the meal today, it doesn't come from us, it comes from the energy and hard work and effort of others. Or if we think about the alms round yesterday, going alms round in Ukiah, Redwood Valley, or the alms round, sorry, today, losing track of the days. This seems so long these days. Uh, The alms round just this morning, Ukiah, Redwood Valley, Fry Vineyards, and just the generosity that takes place there, just the The fact that there's alms food out on the table on the Lunar Observance Day is quite quite amazing, quite remarkable. When we cultivate gratitude and recollect the kindness of others, it's also like an upward spiral. So I like to think of this as being in the flow of merit. So you, you enter into a stream of merit or you enter into a stream of goodness And it keeps flowing onward and upward as long as you don't do something to disturb that stream. So if, for example, I found on Tudong, there would be this stream of goodness that would happen. And each day would be more and more almost unbelievable how the generosity would come about. But then I remember there was one day where somebody wanted to offer some food and it was at the wrong time. It was at 2 p.m. And what we should have done to keep that flow of generosity or that flow of merit going, we should have just accepted it but not eaten it because that would have been fine if we had no intention to eat it. We should have honored the generosity of the donor and accepted it. But instead, I remember explaining, oh, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong time. But this, was, this particular person stopped on the highway and it was like the one time they would do something like that. And I found that actually interrupted the flow of merit. And so then for a few days, things didn't go so well. We still got food, but there was various difficulties and obstacles arising. And so to use that discernment and know resisting things isn't always the right way to go. Sometimes we have to just allow ourselves to be looked after or allow that flow of merit to continue. And that that's really austerity. Austerity is 
doesn't mean being ascetic, but it means being able to flow in any situation, being able to be guided by the generosity. If we have a firm plan, a firm, firmly mapped out plan in our mind, I want my pilgrimage to go this way, I want my tudong to go this way, I want my practice to go this way, I want my holy life to go this way. We're just setting ourselves up for disappointment if we do that. Because then when these magical opportunities arise, where, it's, where there's a little voice off to the side saying, well, go that way, that's actually more wholesome, that's actually more in line with Dhamma. But, we, but then we've got the plan, well, my plan is to go this way, so we have to do we have to be able to readjust and let go of those plans and agendas that we have for ourselves. And we can take this to any level that we want. This is one part of letting go of clinging or lessening our clinging and attachment and being able to flow into different situations that might be perhaps outside of our comfort zone. We do this on the lunar observance day where we have the opportunity to stay up later in meditation. For myself, I kind of crash after 11 p.m. So if I stay up past 11, that's for me, that's outside of my comfort zone. But then to push that and see that, oh, that's, that's that experience. That experience is like that. And that's special when we do that. And that's training as well. Anytime we go out of that comfort zone. And the comfort zone doesn't necessarily mean a physical comfort zone either. It can be a mental or an emotional comfort zone even that we decide to push the boundaries of and push the limitations of. And we don't really know what our limits are unless we test those boundaries and go outside of those boundaries. This is when we start to intuit what the Kruba Ajans are talking about when they talk about boundlessness or what the Buddha is talking about when he talks about boundless loving kindness, boundless compassion, boundless joy, boundless equanimity. It's the mind unbound by those barriers, those comforts that are just built up through our perceptions. kind of inspiring to think about. Lungpur Cha, at a certain point of his practice, uh, in his biography, he's saying that he would meditate and it would be kind of like crossing a bridge, but he couldn't get to the other side of the bridge, or he would just be up against an invisible wall and going to seek advice from a not very well-known Ajahn Mun disciple, I believe his name is Ajahn Wang, and that particular Ajahn saying, giving the advice of you're, you're at the edge of perception, so you, you've reached the edge of your perception. Just keep going there and keep staying at that point. And although that's a very, very advanced stage of meditation that we're talking about there, we can actually apply that to anything so we're, we get hemmed in by our, by our own views and assumptions of reality. Ajahn Sudanto, just having a chat with him the other day, and he was talking about some of the world's top wine tasters being involved in an experiment. Because these, anybody who likes to read labels on things like coffee and wine bottles, although we're probably not, none of us are reading labels on wine bottles, but labels on coffee, where they have these more and more creative taste descriptions on the coffee bags, and I always enjoy reading these. It's like hazelnut butter tones with a, with like a, a sort of chocolatey after hint 
based in earth and wood or you know or whatever so that's the taste that's the taste of the coffee <laughs> and uh, or even more creative than that and more extreme but they uh, they did this experiment with some of the world's top wine tasters who apparently have more than normal taste receptors somehow or something and they took white wine and put a little bit of red dye in it so it looked like red wine and gave it to the world's top taste testers and they all thought it was red wine. They couldn't discern that it was actually white wine. And this is very fascinating because even if we have like some discernment, like these top wine tasters obviously have discernment in terms of taste, it's very easy to get tricked. And so this is happening to us all the time and it makes, it makes me think that what we consider to be reality, so in our experience, our, our edifice of views and perceptions about ourselves and about the world is actually a complete illusion if we think of it in terms of that wine tasting experiment. Just something as simple as a bit of dye in white wine can fool the top experts in terms of not actually knowing that it's a white wine and then actually saying like, oh, this is a red wine with this and this and that quality. Whereas actually it was a white wine with some tasteless dye put into it. So this thinking in this way, it really causes us to then, well, what is my, what is the wall I make around myself? What is the comfort zone I make around myself? You know, what, what are the assumptions I make about, about myself, about who I am, about where I'm at, about, this is an anatta as well. It's a, it leads into the contemplation of not self. Well, all these perceptions are not self. Sankara is not self. Vinyana is not self. The illusory self is like that comfort zone that we're creating. So just being able to have friends where we can have conversations like that that can lead to little insights, like little drips of water, each each insight adding up. And The Buddha said that the the path of insight or the path of realization is very gradual. It's not like being hit by a bolt of lightning all of a sudden. The practice of the Noble Eightfold Path and the realization of the Four Noble Truths, it happens as if it's like a slowly sloping into the ocean. It's The ocean slowly and gradually gets deeper and deeper. It doesn't just drop off right away. That's another analogy the Buddha gives in the suttas. So just learning how to remember the kindness of others, learning how to train ourselves to develop gratitude and thinking about different ways of seeing anicca, not just as impermanence and inconstancy, but also as not sure. And thinking of ways that we can test and prod our our comfort zones that we make for ourselves and therefore make some progress in the practice. And and just remembering that the positive aspect of anicca is that things can change, things can get better, and people can surprise us. We can surprise ourselves. I remember having a conversation with somebody just a few days ago, and I remember thinking, wow, this person's really made some progress in their practice. That, that kind of caught me by surprise, thinking, yeah, people surprise you. I, think, uh, I probably surprised a lot of Thai people who, um, when I was in Anagarika, they had running bets on how fast I was going to leave. And, uh, <laughs> so I surprised them by staying. But they only told me that much later after I, I think it was uh, well after I was five vasas as a monk. <laughs> but they actually were really amazed that I stayed. So these are a few few, uh, thoughts 
for this evening. I'll leave it there. Mm-hmm.